Idle Days on the Yan by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark. Idle Days on the Yan by Lord Dunsany. So I came down through the wood to the bank of Yan and found, as had been prophesied, the ship Bird of the River about to loose her cable. The captain sat cross-legged upon the white deck with a scimitar lying beside him in its jeweled scabbard, and the sailors toiled to spread the nimble sails to bring the ship into the central stream of Yan, and all the while sang ancient soothing songs, and the wind of the evening descending cool from the snowfields of some mountainous abode of distant gods came suddenly, like glad tidings, to an anxious city, into the wing-like sails. And so we came into the central stream, whereat the sailors lowered the greater sails. But I had gone to bow before the captain, and to inquire concerning the miracles and appearances among men of the most holy gods of whatever land he had come from. And the captain answered that he came from fair Belzund, and worshipped gods that were the least and humblest, who seldom sent the famine or the thunder, and were easily appeased with little battles. And I told how I came from Ireland, which is of Europe, whereat the captain and all the sailors laughed, for they said, There are no such places in all the land of dreams. When they had ceased to mock me, I explained that my fancy mostly dwelt in the desert of Kuparnambo, about a beautiful blue city called Galthoth the Damned, which was sentineled all round by wolves and their shadows, and it had been utterly desolate for years and years because of a curse which the gods once spoke in anger and could never since recall. And sometimes my dreams took me as far as Pungarviz, the red-walled city where the fountains are, which trades with the isles and Thala. When I said this, they complimented me on the abode of my fancy, saying that, though they had never seen these cities, such places might well be imagined. For the rest of that evening I bargained with the captain over the sum that I should pay him for my fare, if God and the tide of Yan should bring us safely as far as the cliffs by the sea, which are named Bar Wool Yan, the Gate of Yan. And now the sun had set, and all the colors of the world and heaven had held a festival with him, and slipped one by one away before the imminent approach of night. The parrots had all flown home to the jungle on either bank. The monkeys in rows and safety and high branches of the trees were silent and asleep. The fireflies in the deeps of the forest were going up and down, and the great stars came gleaming out to look on the face of Yan. Then the sailors lighted lanterns and hung them round the ship, and the light flashed out on a sudden and dazzled Yan, and the ducks that fed along his marshy banks all suddenly arose and made wide circles in the upper air and saw the distant reaches of the Yan and the white mist that softly cloaked the jungle before they returned again into their marshes. And then the sailors knelt on the decks and prayed, not all together, but five or six at a time. Side by side there kneeled down together five or six, for there only prayed at the same time men of different faiths, so that no god should hear two men praying to him at once. As soon as any one had finished his prayer, another of the same faith took his place. Thus knelt the row of five or six with bended heads under the fluttering sail, while the central stream of the river Yan took them on towards the sea, and their prayers rose up from among the lanterns and went toward the stars. And behind them in the after end of the ship the helmsman prayed aloud the helmsman's prayer, which is prayed by all who follow his trade upon the river Yan, of whatever faith they be. And the captain prayed to his little lesser gods, to the gods that bless Belzund. And I, too, felt that I would pray. Yet I liked not to pray to a jealous God there where the frail affectionate gods whom the heathen love were being humbly invoked. So I bethought me, instead, of Sheol Nuganoth, whom the men of the jungle have long since deserted, who is now unworshipped and alone. And to him I prayed. And upon us praying the night came suddenly down as it comes upon all men who pray at evening, and upon all men who do not. Yet our prayers comforted our own souls when we thought of the great night to come. 
And so Yan bore us magnificently onwards, for he was elate with molten snow that the Poltiads had brought him from the hills of Hap, and the Marne and Migris were swollen full with floods. And he bore us in his might past Kif and Pir, and we saw the lights of Gulunza. Soon we all slept except the helmsman, who kept the ship in the midstream of Yan. When the sun rose, the helmsman ceased to sing, for by song he cheered himself in the lonely night. When the song ceased, we suddenly all awoke, and another took the helm, and the helmsman slept. We knew that soon we should come to Mandaroon. We made a meal, and Mandaroon appeared. Then the captain commanded, and the sailors loosed again the greater sails, and the ship turned and left the stream of Yan, and came into a harbor beneath the ruddy walls of Mandaroon. Then, while the sailors went and gathered fruits, I came alone to the gate of Mandaroon. A few huts were outside it, in which lived the guard. A sentinel with a long white beard was standing in the gate, armed with a rusty pike. He wore large spectacles, which were covered with dust. Through the gate I saw the city. A deathly stillness was over all of it. The ways seemed untrodden, and moss was thick on doorsteps. In the marketplace huddled figures lay asleep. A scent of incense came wafted through the gateway, of incense and burned poppies. And there was a hum of the echoes of distant bells. I said to the sentinel in the tongue of the region of Yan, Why are they all asleep in this still city? He answered, None may ask questions in this gate for fear they wake the people of the city. For when the people of this city wake, the gods will die. And when the gods die, men may dream no more. And I began to ask him what gods that city worshipped. But he lifted his pike, because none might ask questions there. So I left him and went back to the bird of the river. Certainly Mandaroon was beautiful, with her white pinnacles peering over her ruddy walls and the green of her copper roofs. When I came back again to the bird of the river, I found the sailors were returned to the ship. Soon we weighed anchor and sailed out again, and so came once more to the middle of the river. And now the sun was moving towards his heights, and there had reached us on the river Yan the song of those countless myriads of choirs that attend him in his progress round the world. For the little creatures that have many legs have spread their gauze wings easily on the air, as a man rests his elbows on a balcony, and gave jubilant, ceremonial praises to the sun, or else they move together on the air in wavering dances, intricate and swift, or turned aside to avoid the onrush of some drop of water that a breeze had shaken from a jungle orchid, chilling the air and driving it before it as it fell whirring in its rush to the earth. But all the while they sang triumphantly. For the day is for us, they said, whether our great and sacred father the sun shall bring up more life like us from the marshes, or whether all the world shall end tonight. And there sang all those whose notes are known to human ears, as well as those whose far more numerous notes have never been heard by man. To these a rainy day had been as an era of war that should desolate continents during all the lifetime of a man. And there came also from the dark and steaming jungle to behold and rejoice in the sun the huge and lazy butterflies. And they danced, but danced idly on the ways of the air, as some haughty queen of distant conquered lands might in her poverty and exile dance, in some encampment of the gypsies, for the mere bread to live by. But beyond that would never abate her pride to dance for a fragment more. And the butterflies sung of strange and painted things, of purple orchids and of lost pink cities, and the monstrous colors of the jungle's decay, and they, too, were among those whose voices are not discernible by human ears. And as they floated above the river, going from forest to forest, their splendor was matched by the inimical beauty of the birds who darted out to pursue them. 
or sometimes they settled on the white and wax-like blooms of the plant that creeps and clambers about the trees of the forest, and their purple wings flashed out on the great blossoms as, when the caravans go from neural to face, the gleaming silks flash out upon the snow, where the crafty merchants spread them one by one to astonish the mountaineers of the hills of Nur. But upon men and beasts the sun sent a drowsiness. The river monsters along the river's marge lay dormant in the slime. The sailors pitched a pavilion with golden tassels for the captain upon the deck, and then went, all but the helmsman, under a sail that they had hung as an awning between two masts. Then they told tales to one another, each of his own city, or of the miracles of his god, until all were fallen asleep. The captain offered me the shade of his pavilion with the gold tassels, and there we talked for a while, he telling me that he was taking merchandise to Perdendaris, and that he would take back to Fair Belzund things appertaining to the affairs of the sea. Then, as I watched through the pavilion's opening, the brilliant birds and butterflies that crossed and recrossed the river, I fell asleep, and dreamed that I was a monarch, entering his capital underneath arches of flags, and all the musicians of the world were there, playing melodiously their instruments. But no one cheered. In the afternoon, as the day grew cooler again, I awoke and found the captain buckling on his scimitar, which he had taken off him while he rested. And now we were approaching the wide court of Astahan, which opens upon the river. Strange boats of antique design were chained there to the steps. As we neared it, we saw the open marble court, on three sides of which stood the city fronting on colonnades. And in the court, and along the colonnades, the people of that city walked with solemnity and care, according to the rites of ancient ceremony. All in that city was of ancient device. The carving on the houses, which, when age had broken it, remained unrepaired, was of the remotest times, and everywhere were represented in stone beasts that have long since passed away from earth. The dragon, the griffin, and the hippogriffin and the different species of gargoyle. Nothing was to be found, whether material or custom, that was new in Astahan. Now they took no notice at all of us as we went by, but continued their processions and ceremonies in the ancient city, and the sailors, knowing their custom, took no notice of them. But I called, as we came near, to one who stood beside the water's edge, asking him what men did in Astahan, and what their merchandise was, and with whom they traded. He said, Here we have fettered and manacled time, who would otherwise slay the gods. I asked him what gods they worshipped in that city, and he said, All those gods whom time has not yet slain. Then he turned from me and would say no more, but busied himself in behaving in accordance with ancient custom. And so, according to the will of Jan, we drifted onward and left Astahan. The river widened below Astahan, and we found in greater quantities such birds as prey on fishes. And they were very wonderful in their plumage, and they came not out of the jungle, but flew with their long necks stretched out before them, and their legs lying on the wind behind, straight up the river over the midstream. And now the evening began to gather in. A thick white mist had appeared over the river, and was softly rising higher. It clutched at the trees with long, impalpable arms. It rose higher and higher, chilling the air and white shapes moved away into the jungle, as though the ghosts of shipwrecked mariners were searching stealthily in the darkness for the spirits of evil that long ago had wrecked them on the yon. As the sun sank behind the field of orchids that grew on the matted summit of the jungle, the river monsters came wallowing out of the slime in which they had reclined during the heat of the day, and the great beasts of the jungle came down to drink. The butterflies a while since were gone to rest. In little narrow tributaries that we passed, night seemed already to have fallen, though the sun which had disappeared from us 
had not yet set. And now the birds of the jungle came flying home far over us, with the sunlight glistening pink upon their breasts, and lowered their pinions as soon as they saw the yan, and dropped into the trees. And the widgeon began to go up the river in great companies, all whistling, and then would suddenly wheel and all go down again. And there shot by us the small and arrow-like teal, and we heard the manifold cries of flocks of geese, which the sailors told me had recently come in from crossing over the Lispasian ranges. Every year they come by the same way, close by the peak of Mluna, leaving it to the left, and the mountain eagles know the way they come, and, men say, the very hour, and every year they expect them by the same way as soon as the snows have fallen upon the northern plains. But soon it grew so dark that we saw these birds no more, and only heard the whirring of their wings and of countless others besides, until they all settled down along the banks of the river, and it was the hour when the birds of the night went forth. Then the sailors lit the lanterns for the night, and huge moths appeared, flapping about the ship and at moments their gorgeous colors would be revealed by the lanterns. Then they would pass into the night again, where all was black. And again the sailors prayed, and thereafter we supped and slept, and the helmsman took our lives into his care. When I awoke, I found that we had indeed come to Perdendaris, that famous city, for there it stood upon the left of us, a city fair and notable, and all the more pleasant for our eyes to see after the jungle that was so long with us. And we were anchored by the market-place, and the captain's merchandise was all displayed, and a merchant of Perdendaris stood looking at it. And the captain had his scimitar in his hand, and was beating with it in anger upon the deck. And the splinters were flying up from the white planks, for the merchant had offered him a price for his merchandise that the captain declared to be an insult to himself and his country's gods, whom he now said to be great and terrible gods, whose curses were to be dreaded. But the merchant waved his hands, which were of great fatness, showing the pink palms, and swore that of himself he thought not at all, but only of the poor folk in the huts beyond the city, to whom he wished to sell the merchandise for as low a price as possible, leaving no remuneration for himself. For the merchandise was mostly the thick tumorant carpets that in the winter keep the wind from the floor, and tollub, which the people smoke in pipes. Therefore the merchant said, if he offered a piffic more, the poor folk must go without their tumorants when the winter came, and without their tollub in the evenings, or else he and his aged father must starve together. Thereat the captain lifted his scimitar to his own throat, saying that he was now a ruined man, and that nothing remained to him but death. And while he was carefully lifting his beard with his left hand, the merchant eyed the merchandise again, and said that, rather than see so worthy a captain die, a man for whom he had conceived an especial love when he first saw the manner in which he handled his ship, he and his aged father should starve together, and therefore he offered fifteen piffics more. When he said this, the captain prostrated himself and prayed to his gods that they might yet sweeten this merchant's bitter heart to his little lesser gods to the gods that bless Belzund. At last the merchant offered yet five piffics more. Then the captain wept, for he said that he was deserted of his gods. And the merchant also wept, for he said that he was thinking of his aged father, and of how he soon would starve. And he hid his weeping face with both his hands, and eyed the tollub again between his fingers. And so the bargain was concluded and the merchant took the tumorund and tollub, paying for them out of a great clinking purse. And these were packed up into bales again, and three of the merchant's slaves carried them upon their heads into the city. And all the while the sailors had sat silent, cross-legged in a crescent upon the deck, eagerly watching the bargain. And now a murmur of satisfaction arose among them, and they began to compare it among themselves with other bargains that they had known. And I found out from them that there are seven merchants in Perdendaris, 
and that they had all come to the captain one by one before the bargaining began, and each had warned him privately against the others. And to all the merchants the captain had offered the wine of his own country, that they make him fair belzoond, but could in no wise persuade them to it. But now that the bargain was over, and the sailors were seated at the first meal of the day, the captain appeared among them with a cask of that wine, and we broached it with care, and all made merry together. And the captain was glad in his heart, because he knew that he had much honor in the eyes of his men because of the bargain that he had made. So the sailors drank the wine of their native land, and soon their thoughts were back in fair Belzoond, and the little neighboring cities of Durl and Duz. But for me, the captain poured into a little glass some heavy yellow wine from a small jar which he kept apart among his sacred things. Thick and sweet it was, even like honey. Yet there was in its heart a mighty, ardent fire, which had authority over souls of men. It was made, the captain told me, with great subtlety, by the secret craft of a family of six, who lived in a hut on the mountains of Hianmen. Once in these mountains, he said, he followed the spoor of a bear, and he came suddenly on a man of that family who had hunted the same bear, and he was at the end of a narrow way with precipice all about him, and his spear was sticking in the bear, and the wound not fatal, and he had no other weapon, and the bear was walking towards the man, very slowly because his wound irked him. Yet he was now very close, and what the captain did he would not say, but every year, as soon as the snows are hard, and traveling is easy on the Hanmin, that man comes down to the market in the plains, and always leaves for the captain in the gate of Fair Belzund, a vessel of that priceless secret wine. And as I sipped the wine, and the captain talked, I remembered me of stalwart noble things that I had long since resolutely planned, and my soul seemed to grow mightier within me, and to dominate the whole tide of the Yan. It may be that I then slept, or, if I did not, I do not now minutely recall every detail of that morning's occupations. Towards evening I awoke, and wishing to see Perdendaris before we left in the morning, and being unable to wake the captain, I went ashore alone. Certainly Perdendaris was a powerful city. It was encompassed by a wall of great strength and altitude, having in it hollow ways for troops to walk in, and battlements along it all the way, and fifteen strong towers on it in every mile, and copper plaques low down where men could read them telling in all languages of those parts of the earth, one language on each plaque, the tale of how an army once attacked Perdendaris, and what befell that army. Then I entered Perdendaris, and found all the people dancing, clad in brilliant silks, and playing on the tambang as they danced. For a fearful thunderstorm had terrified them while I slept, and the fires of death, they said, had danced over Perdendaris, and now the thunder had gone leaping away large and black and hideous, they said, over the distant hills, and had turned round snarling at them, showing his gleaming teeth, and had stamped as he went upon the hilltops until they rang as though they had been bronze. And often and again they stopped in their merry dance, and prayed to the God they knew not, saying, O oh God, that we know not, we thank thee for sending the thunder back to his hills. And I went on and came to the market-place, and lying there upon the marble pavement, I saw the merchant fast asleep, and breathing heavily, with his face and the palms of his hands towards the sky, and slaves were fanning him to keep away the flies. And from the market-place I came to a silver temple, and then to a palace of onyx, and there were many wonders in Perdendaris, and I would have stayed and seen them all. But as I came to the outer wall of the city, I suddenly saw in it a huge ivory gate. For a while I paused and admired it. Then I came nearer and perceived the dreadful truth. The gate was carved out of one solid peace. 
I fled at once through the gateway and down to the ship, and even as I ran, I thought that I heard far off on the hills behind me the tramp of the fearful beast by whom that mass of ivory was shed, who was perhaps even then looking for his other tusk. When I was on the ship again, I felt safer, and I said nothing to the sailors of what I had seen. And now the captain was gradually awakening. Now night was rolling up from the east and north, and only the pinnacles of the towers of Perdendera still took the fallen sunlight. Then I went to the captain and told him, quietly, of the thing I had seen, and he questioned me at once about the gate in a low voice that the sailors might not know, and I told him how the weight of the thing was such that it could not have been brought from afar, and the captain knew that it had not been there a year ago. We agreed that such a beast could never have been killed by any assault of man, and that the gate must have been a fallen tusk, and one fallen near, and recently. Therefore he decided that it were better to flee at once, so he commanded, and the sailors went to the sails, and others raised the anchor to the deck, and just as the highest pinnacle of marble lost the last rays of the sun, we left Perdendaris, that famous city. And night came down and cloaked Perdendaris, and hid it from our eyes, which, as things have happened, will never see it again. For I have heard, since, that something swift and wonderful has suddenly wrecked Perdendaris in a day. Towers, and walls, and people. And the night deepened over the river Yan, a night all white with stars. And with the night there rose the helmsman's song. As soon as he had prayed, he began to sing to cheer himself all through the lonely night. But first he prayed, praying the helmsman's prayer. And this is what I remember of it, rendered into English, with a very feeble equivalent of the rhythm that seemed so resonant in those tropic nights. To whatever God may hear. Wherever there be sailors, whether of river or sea, whether their way be dark or whether through storm, whether their peril be of beast or of rock, or from enemy lurking on land or pursuing on sea, wherever the tiller is cold or the helmsman stiff, wherever sailors sleep or helmsmen watch, guard, guide, and return us to the old land that has known us, to the far homes that we know, to all the gods that are, to whatever god may hear. So he prayed, and there was silence. And the sailors laid them down to rest for the night. The silence deepened, and was only broken by the ripples of yawn that lightly touched our prow. Sometimes some monster of the river coughed. Silence and ripples ripples, and silence again. And then his loneliness came upon the helmsman, and he began to sing, and he sang the market songs of Durl and Duz, and the old dragon legends of Belzund. Many a song he sang, telling to spacious and exotic Jan the little tales and trifles of his city of Durl. And the songs welled up over the black jungle, and came into the clear, cold air above, and the great bands of stars that look on Yan began to know the affairs of Durl and Duz, and of the shepherds that dwelt in the fields between, and the flocks that they had, and the loves that they had loved, and all the little things that they hoped to do. And as I laid wrapped up in skins and blankets, listening to those songs, and watching the fantastic shapes of the great trees like to black giants stalking through the night. I suddenly fell asleep. When I awoke, great mists were trailing away from the yon, and the flow of the river was tumbling now tumultuously, and little waves appeared, for yon had scented from afar the ancient crags of Glorm, and knew that their ravines lay cool before him, wherein he should meet the merry wild Irillion, rejoicing from fields of snow. 
So he shook off from him the torpid sleep that had come upon him in the hot and scented jungle, and forgot its orchids and its butterflies, and swept on turbulent, expectant, strong. And soon the snowy peaks of the hills of Glorm came glittering into view. And now the sailors were waking up from sleep. Soon we all eat, and then the helmsman laid him down to sleep while a comrade took his place, and they all spread over him their choicest furs. And in a while we heard the sound that the Aurelian made as she came down dancing from the fields of snow, and then we saw the ravine in the hills of Glorm lying precipitous and smooth before us into which we were carried by the leaps of Jan. And now we left the steamy jungle and breathed the mountain air. The sailors stood up and took deep breaths of it, and thought of their own far-off Acrochian hills, on which were Durl and Duz. Below them in the plains stands fair Belzund. A great shadow brooded between the cliffs of Glorm, but the crags were shining above us like gnarled moons, and almost lit the gloom. Louder and louder came the Aurelian's song, and the song of her dancing down from the fields of snow. And soon we saw her white and full of mists, and wreathed with rainbows delicate and small that she had plucked up near the mountain's summit from some celestial garden of the sun. Then she went away seawards with the huge gray yawn, and the ravine widened and opened upon the world, and our rocking ship came through. To the light of the day. And all that morning and all the afternoon we passed through the marshes of Ponduvery, and Jan widened there, and flowed solemnly and slowly, and the captain bade the sailors beat on bells to overcome the dreariness of the marches. At last the Erusian mountains came in sight, nursing the villages of Penkai and Blut, and the wandering streets of Mlo where priests propitiate the avalanche with wine and maize. Then night came down over the plains of Tlun, and we saw the lights of Capardania. We heard the path knights beating upon drums as we passed Imaut and Golzunda. Then all but the helmsmen slept, and villages scattered along the banks of the Yan heard all that night in the helmsmen's unknown tongue the little songs of cities that they knew not. I awoke before dawn, with a feeling that I was unhappy before I remembered why. Then I recalled that by the evening of the approaching day, according to all foreseen probabilities, we should come to Bar Wul Yan, and I should part from the captain and his sailors. And I had liked the man because he had given me of his yellow wine that was set apart among his sacred things and many a story he had told me about his fair Belzund between the Acrochian hills and the Hyanmin, and I had liked the ways that his sailors had, and the prayers that they prayed at evening side by side, grudging not one another their alien gods, and I had a liking, too, for the tender way in which they often spoke of Durl and Daz, for it is good that men should love their native cities and the little hills that hold those cities up. And I had come to know who would meet them when they returned to their homes, and where they thought the meetings would take place, some in a valley of the Acrochian hills, where the road comes up from Yan, others in the gateway of one or another of the three cities, and others by the fireside in the home. And I thought of the danger that had menaced us all alike outside Perdendaris, a danger that, as things have happened, was very real. And I thought, too, of the helmsman's cheery song in the cold and lonely night, and how he had held our lives in his careful hands. And as I thought of this, the helmsman ceased to sing, and I looked up and saw a pale light had appeared in the sky, and the lonely night had passed and the dawn widened, and the sailors awoke. And soon we saw the tide of the sea himself advancing resolute between Jan's borders, and Jan sprang lithely at him, and they struggled a while. Then Jan and all that was his were pushed back northward, so that the sailors had to hoist the sails, and, the wind being favorable, 
we still held onwards. And we passed Gondara, and Narl, and Haz, and we saw memorable holy Golnas, and heard the pilgrims praying. When we awoke after the midday rest, we were coming near to Nen, the last of the cities on the river Yan, and the jungle was all about us once again, and about Nen. But the great Mloon ranges stood up over all things, and watched the city from beyond the jungle. Here we anchored, and the captain and I went up into the city, and found that the wanderers had come into Nen. And the wanderers were a weird, dark tribe, that once in every seven years came down from the peaks of Mloon, having crossed by a pass that is known to them from some fantastic land that lies beyond, and the people of Nen were all outside their houses, and all stood wondering at their own streets. For the men and women of the wanderers had crowded all the ways, and every one was doing some strange thing. Some danced astounding dances that they had learned from the desert wind, rapidly curving and swirling till the eye could follow no longer. Others played upon instruments beautiful, wailing tunes that were full of horror, which souls had taught them, lost by night in the desert, that strange far desert from which the wanderers came. None of their instruments were such as were known in Nen, nor in any part of the regions of the Yan. Even the horns out of which some were made were of beasts that none had seen along the river, for they were barbed at the tips, and they sang in the language of none songs that seemed to be akin to the mysteries of night and to the unreasoned fear that haunts dark places. Bitterly, all the dogs of Nen distrusted them, and the wanderers told one another fearful tales, for though no one in Nen knew aught of their language, they could see the fear in the listeners' faces, and as the tale wound on, the whites of their eyes showed vividly in terror, as the eyes of some little beast whom the hawk has seized. Then the teller of the tale would smile and stop, and another would tell his story, and the teller of the first tale's lips would chatter with fear. And if some deadly snake chanced to appear, the wanderers would greet him as a brother, and the snake would seem to give his greetings to them before he passed on again. Once that most fierce and lethal of tropic snakes, the giant Lythra, came out of the jungle and all down the street, the central street of Nen, and none of the wanderers moved away from him, but they all played sonorously on drums, as though he had been a person of much honor and the snake moved through the midst of them, and smote none. Even the wanderer's children could do strange things, for if any one of them met with a child of Nen, the two would stare at each other in silence with large grave eyes. Then the wanderer's child would slowly draw from his turban a live fish or snake, and the children of Nen could do nothing of that kind at all. Much I should have wished to stay and hear the hymn with which they greet the night, that is answered by the wolves on the heights of Mloon. But it was now time to raise the anchor again, that the captain might return from Bar Wulyan upon the landward tide. So we went on board and continued down the Yan. And the captain and I spoke little, for we were thinking of our parting, which should be for long. And we watched instead the splendor of the westering sun, for the sun was a ruddy gold, but a faint mist cloaked the jungle lying low, and into it poured the smoke of the little jungle cities, and the smoke of them met together in the mist, and joined into one haze, which became purple, and was lit by the sun, as the thoughts of men become hallowed by some great and sacred thing. Sometimes one column from a lonely house would rise up higher than the city's smoke, and gleam by itself in the sun. And now, as the sun's last rays were nearly level, we saw the sight that I had come to see. For from two mountains that stood on either shore, two cliffs of pink marble came out into the river, all glowing in the light of the low sun, and they were quite smooth and of mountainous altitude, and they nearly met, 
and Yon went tumbling between them and found the sea. And this was Bar Wol Yan, the gate of Yan. And in the distance through that barrier's gap, I saw the azure indescribable sea, where little fishing boats went gleaming by. And the sun set, and the brief twilight came, and the exultation of the glory of Bar Wol Yan was gone. Yet still the pink cliffs glowed, the fairest marvel that the eye beheld. And this in a land of wonders. And soon the twilight gave place to the coming out of stars, and the colors of Bar Wol Yan went dwindling away. And the sight of those cliffs was to me as some chord of music that a master's hand had launched from the violin, which carries to heaven or fairy the tremulous spirits of men. And now by the shore they anchored and went no further, for they were sailors of the river and not of the sea, and knew the Yan, but not the tides beyond. And the time was come when the captain and I must part, he to go back again to his fair Belzund in sight of the distant peaks of the Hian Min, and I to find my way by strange means back to those hazy fields that all poets know, wherein stand small, mysterious cottages through whose windows, looking westwards, you may see the fields of men, and looking eastwards, see glittering elfin mountains tipped with snow, going range on range into the region of myth and beyond it into the kingdom of fantasy, which pertained to the lands of dream. Long we regarded one another, knowing that we should meet no more, for my fancy is weakening as the years slip by, and I go ever more seldom into the lands of dream. Then we clasped hands uncouthly on his part, for it is not the method of greeting in his country and he commended my soul to the care of his own gods, to his little lesser gods, the humble ones, to the gods that bless Belzund. End of Idle Days on the Yan